Okay. Uh, good day or hello. Today we're going to uh, talk about agglomeration and we'll label this agglomeration one. And just introduce the whole subject of agglomeration, so to speak. Uh, first point about agglomeration is recognized as a really cool subject. Uh, I would consider myself educated quite a bit, and then I ran across this area of agglomeration, and I certainly have gone through an order of magnitude improvement and understanding of things. So uh, uh, agglomeration is uh, something that is neglected as a topic, typically. However, some of the books that I've used, uh, Dispersing Powers and Liquid, this, Ralph Nelson was, or is, I'm not sure if he's still working, the powders person inside uh, DuPont. Then we have Peach, Size Enlargement, by Agglomeration, really cool uh, book. Uh, spend some time reading that. And as opposed to Crushing and Grinding, I also have, uh, Crushing and grinding plays a key role in agglomeration, by the way. So I threw in a little bit of that, that book, Posh book. Then uh, C.A. Hawley, Private Communications, and I have the FAO Tech General Catalog, which was very helpful. Um, this chap is, I think, is a very interesting fellow. If Anyway, uh, ha uh, Handbook of Powder and Science Technology. It's uh, maybe a two-inch thick book, contributed chapter book. A lot of information in there. And of course, we have Perry's Handbook, which I have lifted some stuff in the, from in Perry's. And then we have McCabe and Smith and Harriet Unit Operations. So those are the various sources that I used. All of them are, are very good courses, uh, very good sources, I should say. So proceeding along, um, talk about some of the general aspects in agglomeration. First, uh, agglomeration or size enlargement, uh, let's just call it agglomeration. Combining materials together to form a larger eye, or a larger particle. Agglomeration has a number of different mechanisms, chemical, mechanical, physical, electrical. Uh, chemical by bonding, uh, mechanical by physical binding, and mushing together, physically by melting together, and attraction, electrical uh, attraction, charge attraction. So uh, agglomeration has a lot of different things to it. Okay. Lots of ways it can happen. That's why it makes it so com somewhat kind of interesting. So unit operation in many processes occurs in lots of ways. Agglomeration is considered search, uh, short range, short range, basically, uh, on individual particles, basically. Uh, surfaces, I mean by short range, I mean surfaces when two surfaces come in contact. You have coalescence of particles and growth of larger agglomerates by adhering particles. Anyway, agglomeration uh, has various different names associated with it, briquetting, tabulating, granulating, pelletizing, pelleting, cindering, balling, beating, pressing, compaction, clustering, molding, shaping, encapsulation, sizing, and more. Obviously, processes aided by agglomeration, obviously, slides enlargement, useful in dust control or uh, precipitation, filtration, clarification by precipitation, you precipitate material and then you agglomerate it. Clarification or thickening, crystal growth, growth and more. Why agglomeration? Well, typically you need it to develop specific product character characteristics, and we'll go to the table here. And uh, the objectives of size enlargement, I think I've lifted this from Perry's handbook, if I'm not mistaken, so you can go check Perry's. Useful structural forms like uh, powder metallurgy, uh, defined quantity for dispersing and metering, elimination of dust, improved flowability, perhaps reduce caking, improve uh, increase or change bulk density, creation, anyway, a whole bunch of things. 
And this apparently is by uh, reprinted from granulation coating technology for high value added industries. Anyway, so those are the various objectives of agglomeration. Uh, we go through and we see uh, product area, aggregates, briquetting, uh, compacting, agricultural chemicals, feed production, ceramics, detergents, dust, right? What's wanted? Wanted. Uh, for example, after spray drying, you throw uh, detergents, after spray drying detergents, you throw it in a fluidized bed. So they agglomerate or clump together, clump together and make something that is, has high instantization. It dissolves instantly in liquids. Unwanted, see, agglomeration is wanted for various reasons. And agglomeration is not wanted for various reasons. Usually this is build up caking, uh, build up caking flow problems, build up caking lumping, what have you. So you're pretty much all the same. You don't want it to happen. Here you want it to happen, right? For example, where is one? Agricultural chemicals, this changes around a bit, just say in the seeds, seed business. Used to be you just go buy grass seed. Now you buy grass seed that has a coating of uh, insecticide on it, perhaps, or herbicide, whatever. Um, then you have a coating of fertilizer, and then you have a coating of mulch on the outer perimeter of the seed. So you have a single seed with four, three or four layers on it, and those layers were formed by agglomeration process. Uh, fertilizers, instead of dealing with dust, you deal with pellets. You can uh, also be interested in uh, handling filter cakes, you know, organics, pigments, polymers. Again, you have what you want to have happen, and then, okay, of course, the uh, desire not to have agglomeration in the way of buildup. If we go now and give some examples here, we got all sorts of pellets and pills and uh, briquettes and uh, what would you call this thing? A uh, shredded wheat, uh, shredded wheats. Anyway, side view of different types of pell uh, pills that can be made. Do you know a perfectly round sphere is, is, has difficulty in making in, in a pill machine? Anyway, um, agglomerate, uh, pills are agglomeration of powder. And what's interesting is agglomeration of powder, you gotta get the air out. So not only is fusing the powder together into a pill, you also have air escape routes. And here's an example of some shapes made from tabulating machines, I guess. Oh, that was C. What's B here? B is catalyst pellets, extrusion and cutting. Forget about catalyst pellets. Just think about it as perhaps candy, different shapes of candy for children. Anyway, three major areas, largest users of size enlargement. Raw material suppliers, the iron and steel industry pelletizes iron ore. Cement industry and fertilizers. Iron and steel cinder balls are easily stored and transported. Basically, you have, say, uh, in, in the metal business, I shouldn't just say steel and iron, but in the mining metals industry, lots and lots of condens, uh, lots of what, 95% of all materials, all metals are floated these days. So flotation is actually a very uh, poorly studied area. It's extremely important in uh, mineral development. So you have flotation concentrates that can be agglomerated, very, very useful. Dust can be agglomerated. You can upgrade ore with uh, most gold, I think, has gotten to such low concentrations that it's often floated or is floated. So flotation goes along. So that very fine raw materials are agglomerated, calcined, basically. Fertilizer granulates helps in transport and application. Dust-free operations, uniform applications, no 
significant hot spots, right? No health health hazards, no segregation during storage. So lots of advantages of agglomeration in that regard. We already covered some of the objectives of agglomeration. Agglomeration improves spreadability of most solids. Agglomeration provides coarse particles with large surface areas, again, used to make catalysts and absorbents, absorbents in particular, very used to handle fines and dust, used to make new fangled grass seed, for example. Agglomeration is used in, uh, to handle, pack, store, transport, feed, meat, or solids. Right. Agglomeration of fine particles reduce transporting costs and packing costs in handle larger volumes. Agglomeration improves flowability and predicts automatic metering and dispersing to be used. Foodstuffs, agglomeration of foodstuffs, which are pow uh, powder are difficult to feed. So if you agglomerate them up a bit, they're easier to feed. Easier, easily formed into granular products, vitamins, trace elements, and antibiotics. Agglomeration, no segregation will occur, no separation. You have two types of powders in the world, free-flowing powders and non-free-flowing powders. Free-flowing powders will demix, in other words, they'll separate. If, there, if it's a powder mixture and it's free-flowing, that means it can move about. Basically, they can uh, demix, cause problems. Agglomeration is used in, increasingly in foodstuffs, rock salt, cocoa, fines, reduce flowability, get rid of fines. The existence of fines reduces flowability. Fines are separated off for agglomeration. Granular material are often have bulk, high bulk density, little or no dust. And it's very important. Agglomeration produces well-defined bulk properties. There you go. Fine waste products are agglomerated to improve collection in the environment. It could be that you take a waste stream of fine particles, agglomerate it up, and you got a new product. So where do you want agglomeration? Where do you not want agglomeration? Well, crushing and grinding, size reduction. Any mechanical separation, particle classification, you don't want agglomeration. Mixing of particles, you don't want to have agglomeration. Size analysis, you don't want to have agglomeration. Solids transports and feeders and pipelines. Solid storage and silos, you don't want, think about it this way, you have a huge silo of solids and suddenly they're all fused together. You got a serious issue. Metering of solids, drying of solids, coating of individual particles. So there's much technical effort technical effort and prevention or destruction of agglomerates. In many, many processes, agglomeration is first class pain. Many, many processes, agglomeration is to be prevented. Now, these are underlined and just to give you a comment on this word processor. I tried to remove this underlining, it must have been four or five times already. For some reason, there's some sort of code in this that prevents me from re removing that underlying. I haven't figured out how to get rid of it. Particles, well, understanding particles help in understanding agglomeration. Particle sizes obviously range eight orders of magnitude, right, from submicron, basically, uh, up to an inch or two. Particles may be individual or collection. First off, different properties exist. You have the chemical, physical, mechanical, electrical. You should put in electrical for particles and for agglomerates. And so if I have a collection of particles, collective properties exist. So I have particles based upon the elements there. And then I have particles based upon whether they're part of an agglomerate, which brings up bulk density, the strength of the agglomerate, the flowability of the agglomerate, and what sort of capillary pressures do I have? If the particle agglomerate is porous, it will suck up liquid and dissolve a lot more rapidly. That's called instantization. Surface and internal properties also become important. 
properties, uh, these properties may change with size, structural imperfections diminish at smaller sizes. So individual particles have greater strength at smaller sizes, less flaws. If I do size reduction or look at flaws as a function of size, I find that large flaws are only in large particles. Adhesion becomes more prevalent at less than 100 microns. Smaller particles coat agglomerate cake more easily than large particles. Processing and handling problems increase with smaller diameter sizes. Right. Ill reversible deformation may occur at small sizes. Particle fines coats, well, particles and fines coat the fines have similar properties. What often happens is you find surface effects dictates behavior. Right. So uh, some of these. Let's go up here. Um, one of the ones I want to bring out. Uh, for example, uh, smaller particles coat. Okay. Now in the cooking industry, you have. Uh, uh, donuts. And the way you prevent donuts from agglomerating is you coat them with sugar, powder, uh, granular sugar, or powdered sugar. In both cases, uh, it'll prevent donuts from sticking together. You have hard candy, and preventing hard candy from sticking together, you dust them with a layer of sugar, and it keeps the two surfaces apart and they don't agglomerate. You know, take a case in point, you have hard candy around Christmas time or during the holidays anytime. And uh, by February or so, uh, the individual uh, hard candy chunks have fused together into one big lump, right? So uh, it prevents, uh, you put in what might be referred to as uh, stopping dust, basically, uh, stop agglomeration. There's sometimes when you want agglomeration and sometimes you don't. Anyway, let's go on. Particles, well, if I look at particles, this I, take, I took from Nelson's book. Um, you have long, spher uh, round spherical granulars, you have cubes, you can have needles, you can have flakes, you can have a brace of materials, you can have F, which is a, a twin here, it seems like a twin. And then you have a mosaic and an aggregate. I don't know what the difference is in some of these, but I call them all agglomerate. Past this size here, I have, that's an agglomerate, that's an agglomerate, that's an agglomerate. This is cinder agglomerate. And porous, well, this is not necessarily agglomerate unless you consider the material inside as not necessarily pores, but another type of material. You have heterogeneous material, right? Take a piece of granite and look at it. You have dark chunks of granite, uh, dark dark chunks in the granite and also light, lighter color chunks in granite. So the material is heterogeneous. Uh, the surface is extremely important because surface, there are seven different surface chemistries or eight, seven or eight different surface chemistries which controls the agglomeration process. Here we had cindering going on, right? K is cindered. And then uh, L is basically gel bonded, whatever the gel is in between. But these are actually very similar to each other in that you have one material, perhaps the material here and the gel being, perhaps you have different chemistries involved with the cinder. Anyway, you have these as examples of agglomerates. These are examples of agglomerates. Agglomerate. This is an example of agglomerate. I'm not quite sure what you would call this. Basically, I uh, have a particle with long polymer molecules on them, and that's very important for flocculation, perhaps. But anyway, uh, the important uh, concept here 
is there's a whole big portion of solids that are actually agglomerates. We'll just throw in G and H up here as well. So amongst these are agglomerates. Aggregates, agglomerates, it's all pretty much the same sort of thing. There's some sort of mechanism that causes the material to fuse together. And when we get to discuss the different mechanism of agglomerates, you'll see uh, there's different ways agglomerates are made. You drove to work today on an agglomerate, the agglomerate being an asphalt. Most blacktop is a mixture of tar and aggregate from a crushing company. Or anyway, asphalt is an agglomerate. Nature is size dependent and the results depend upon the size. Smaller particles are more reactive. Rinding increases the reactivity of some materials. Basically, it provides a fresh surface. As I said, going back to here, uh, heterogeneous solids, but also the surface with seven different surface chemistries again, doesn't necessarily mean that what's on the chemistry on the surface is the same as the chemistry inside. So you have uh, that going on. And basically the surface can actually be poisoned, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and to create a new surface would be to get rid of the poison and expose new surface to processing. So anyway, so very small particles become surfaces, right? It's very important. Large particles are so far less reactive. A variety of structures and chemical compositions will occur, okay? Surface ha surfaces happen to be very magical uh, places, they're magical places. Example, take a, a simple experiment. You uh, cook two hot dogs together, okay? Excuse me, cook two hot dogs in a microwave. Keep them separate and then take out two more identical hot dogs, cook them, and have them touch each other. Now, to cook a hot dog in the microwave, the, sur the, the energy first hits the surface, right? And so you have, the head energy has to penetrate inside the hot dog. So then you have, if you look at the hot dog, as you microwave it, the nature of the surface appears to be, uh, appears to be changed. And, as you microwave a hot dog, you put the two hot dogs together and have them touch. Now you have a magical place touching another magical place. And you go ahead and cook your hot dogs uh, in the microwave and they'll fuse together. If they don't fuse together, then that will become further on, further microwaving will probably produce a burn spot. So Surfaces are magical places. To control the surface often controls the process. Very small particles are uh, become surfaces. An example, another example of this would be dandruff. Dandruff uh, stays on your shoulders and you now have a professional, a, 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 a social disease called dandruff. So you, take, uh, you have to buy dandruff shampoo to get rid of it. Okay. If you wear a white shirt, they're in the problem, but if, uh, you know, dark. So very small particles or surfaces, they stay there for reasons, perhaps electrostatic, dandruff stays on your shoulders for various reasons, electrostatics or van der Waal forces or whatever. However, if I take a big bowling ball and put it on my shoulder, then uh, it's not gonna stay there because electrostatic forces, so it'll fall off. So surfaces versus uh, objects, you have differences here. And very small par particles, essentially the important surfaces are the important forces are the surface forces. So you have uh, strange uh, behavior changing with size. Physics changes with size. So it's very important to recognize that. And physics change with the nature of the surface as well. Okay. Uh, fundamental problem, uh, properties, you can have a pure crystalline solid, you can have the highest degree of crystal lattice, the highest degree of homogeneity, highest density and lowest void fraction, fewer, fewer voids. 
Okay. Purity, I always thought crystals were pure. Well, crystals are pure, but pure crystals are also impure. So purity of a crystal depends upon the gr crystal rate of growth. If you grow crystals very slowly, results in high purity levels. However, if you grow them very fast, like perhaps in the formation of an agglomerate, you can have inclusions, you can have considerable impurities, you can have considerable flaws, which means impurities, and they're not pure. And the agglomerate of crystals, crystals may be an agglomerate fused together. So they're not necessarily pure. Non-crystalline solids can also have a high homogeneity, no voids down to the atomic level. However, having said that, I can also claim that non-crystalline solids can have high non-homogeneity as well. Again, depending upon how they were put together, the environment and how they were put together. Variety of particles, twins, mosaics, wheat, show those. Particle shape and surface. Well, spheres usually are desired because they have the higher densities, they have better flowability and lower coding demands, okay, or coding difficulties. Rod distribution of particle volumes and shapes occur from batch to batch and in a batch. There tends to be a lack of reproducibility. Okay, again, we're talking about shape and surfaces. Considerable technical effort has been spent in finding how to control particle shape. I don't. Okay, shape is controlled by adding ions or surfactants to, to control surface growth. Shape can affect particle size measurements, it affects the way a particle size measurements are done. Going back to our picture by Nelson here. See, uh, this has a diameter. Its diameter is very important. It's been well characterized with the diameter. This is a cube. It's probably well characterized by the length of one side. However, we start doing variations and ask what's the size of this needle. And quickly you find the diameter doesn't work very well for you. Diameter may be the di uh, cross-sectional area of this needle. And surface area may actually be uh, dependent upon this length. So you have the length of the needle and the diameter of the needle. Then we get to this flake. See, one of the interesting things about a needle is it will pass through an opening larger than its cross section. So oftentimes in, in, in screening operations, you'll find the needle will go through the screen, although this length is much larger than the screen opening. They turn up on end and go through. Then we get the question was, what's the diameter of this flake? Well, the diameter of the flake is, uh, which, the thickness of the flake or the side length of the flake or both? So uh, diameter works only so much, but if you're getting a particle size measurements, then perhaps you should have to go into figuring out what shape is. Where, where were we? Okay, let's see here. Shape can be controlled, of course, there we go. Surface roughness and porosity. Basically, higher t roughness reduces particle attraction, keeps the particles apart. Higher roughness hinders bonding, All right? Increase the need for more coating. It could be rough and you need to coat, a, coat, the, coat the roughness away. Potential for having internal surfaces, inside surfaces. Again, surface itself is a pain in the neck. You don't know if it's internal surface, external surface. Surfaces are large pores. What's the porosity when the pores are not exposed? What's the surface area? Surface area, surface area, who has the surface area? It's a real first class pain in the neck for uh, in uh, modern technology surfaces are. Anyway, so we said heterogeneous, heterogeneous solids, inhomogeneous solids occur, you have a maldistribution of minor components exists, you have the presence of maybe two or more solid phases, you have seven different chemistries 
and leading to more variety and difficulty in processing, more varied processing. For example, if I have a aluminum, I have a particles containing aluminum can have on the surface aluminum ox uh, aluminum plus 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 aluminum ion could be a complex with I have aluminum hydroxide or aluminum chloride or I have aluminum oxide or I have aluminum hydroxide all kinds of stuff that can be on the surface that changes the nature of the surface than what's on the inside okay surfaces surfaces who's got the surface variety of physical situations can occur maldistribution inside the particle coated evenly or unevenly on the surface or inside pores and crevices separated particles in a physical mix of particles right changes in condition of making powders can strongly affect the nature of the surface abrasion of coated particles may change the surface nature of the particle you have the particle coated and it's protected and then along comes abrasion that would remove the remove the coating fouling settling complex and chemical reaction activity may change okay so you have chemical classes of solids surfaces these the agglomerate solids if you know their surface chemistry particle surface determines the behavior to a great degree so you have metallic or metal surfaces by uh, black, carbon black oxides and hydroxide salts non-oxide refractories non-polar polymers polar polymers biological materials that sort of opens up a whole can of worms biological materials uh, algae growth for example different types of powders uh, free flowing to caking powders or free flowing to non free flowing free flowing is quite different than non free flowing free flowing often has no inner particle forces whereas non free flowing there must be something making the material stick together complex powders may be spe process specific surface behavior affects agglomeration Effects are not necessarily constant experimentation is necessary. Humidity has a significant effect. If I have wet sand, right, I can build sand castles on the beach. However, it's a dry sand, I don't think I will have any problem or I won't have any success in building castles out of dry sand. sand. So building sand castles on a beach is agglomeration process. Now, if you get into powders and paste, there's not a clear division between what's a powder and what's a paste. They can merge. You try to characterize your powder to know what it is. That's helpful. Free flowing versus non free flowing. Moves like and appears like a low viscosity liquid for free flowing. May code adhere to the walls by static charge. Surface behavior does not have an effect. They ag segregate or demix easily and they don't agglomerate so they need to be included for agglomeration non-free flowing powders there's a binding mechanism present wet sand on the beach you have water holding the particles together binding the particles together these do not flow easily and may be not be coated or adhered to the walls they sort of like are kind of non-clingy uh, they often have moisture to them, which shorts out any electric charge. They may also have substantial slippage planes. They don't segregate or demix. That's why you, and they may agglomerate. That's why you have free, non free flowing powders, so they don't demix. Okay, so I have you a little experiment to do. I want you to take salt and pepper and put them on top of each other on a tabletop and see if you can separate the salt from the uh, pepper. Pepper is flakes, the salt is going to be more granular, so you already have a shape effect difference between the two. Okay, 
Let's go into agglomerate formation and the very effects of agglomerates, right? Well, there's two types of forces out here that are important here. We have body forces, which is a general category of forces that depends upon a legs cubed. Then you have a surface force or surface forces, again, a general category of forces that depend upon the area. Surface forces hold the agglomerate together. Well, body forces may hold the agglomerate together as well. Anyway, surface forces, moisture, residue solv solvents, forming bridges, water hydration, electrostatic charges, van der Waal, other like magnetic surface force, the criteria is a surface force, dominates over all forces. And to make an agglomerate, surface forces dominate, have to dominate. They dominate over body forces. That means gravity, inertia, or drag, which tend to be body forces. Torques from these forces must be small to keep the particle together. But here is the six or seven mechanisms by which agglomerates are Excuse me, agglomerates are made. Yes, agglomerates. First and foremost, let's get rid of the uh, matrix binder here. This is basically asphalt. Asphalt is a uh, agglomerate, very important agglomerate considering where it is. So you have the individual aggregate stone in there covered with pitch or tar or and then at the end, you got the agglomerate. Then you have the potential, let's go back to A. We just finished F, let's go back to A here. Uh, you have cinder bridges, partial melding, crystallization. In other words, you have two particles that are close together and because they're touching, uh, they can generate friction because of the touch <coughs> or they're hot and they fuse together by cindering or they fuse together by partial melting. They partially melt, flow together, and then solidify again, and possibly by crystallization. So we have that type of agglomeration being formed. Then we have two different chemistries involved here, which is possible. And then we coat the two particles with a binder or a binder, high viscosity binder. You have layers, you have hardening binders, you have possibly a chemical reactions going on here. Okay, coating is through the entire uh, surface area. Here the uh, coating is only between two, two particles, not the entire surface area of the particles. So again, these are liquid bridges. You could potentially have, by liquid bridges, we should say that these two solids, let's go back and say these two solids are the same thing, right? So it's sitting there, it's hard candy, Christmas time. They're touching at a point. So by February, there has been substantial condensation from the air and condensed here and has dissolved the solid to the point where uh, it's high concentrate and then evaporates. It's high concentration liquid bridge, which then dries up and evaporates, and now you have a solid bridge. So the hard candy it becomes fused together. Then we have electrostatic forces, the idea of my or, excuse me, I don't have dandruff, no, no. Anyway, the idea of dandruff clinging to a shirt, the idea of a single hair, a very long hair perhaps, clinging to your shirt, okay. Uh, so these are molecular forces, they could be van der Waal forces, they could be electrostatic forces, Valency forces, I guess, means van der Waal. They potentially be magnetic forces. So, anyway, there is uh, not quite sure if there's anything in between the two particles. Then we have close bonds, clo uh, formed closed bonds. They, uh, the particle is, although it's a solid, 
may be small enough to reach its a brittle plastic transition point, and they deform and fuse together. Anyway, again, they could be different materials, and they fuse together in a convenient fashion to lower the uh, void frag, the voids, the void content. So those are some of the different ways agglomerates form. I'm sure it's not the only one. No, there's others, I'm sure. So you got to ask yourself, what are the different forces? What is the meth, um, mechanism of agglomeration? And what's the strength of the agglomerate? After you do these, the question is, how good is the structure? Is it uh, attractive forces are short ranged. Strength decreases rapidly with distance. So, among the parameters that you might be interested in is the contact area and bond force per area. All sources are rough, but not uh, to the same degree. Right? Our surfaces are rough, but not to the same degree. Contact geometry is important. Rough surfaces are difficult to bond and hinder formation of larger particles. Rough surfaces are where smaller particles adhere. Rough surfaces may be a lot larger than the smaller particles, so they sort of like giving safe haven to small particles. Anyway, I would keep it there. Finding two spheres of the same size is much more difficult than binding a sphere to a flat plane. Surface forces require contact points or surface to surface points. These are small in number and distance apart is large. The bond is going to be weak. Agglomerate breaks apart. Bonds are not perfect. Right? You have inclusions, flaws, et cetera, are high. The nature of the surface is critical. And of course, we have surface degrees and we have coating that prevents bonding, i.e. the sugar coating on hard candy, powdered sugar coating on donuts are examples. Anyway. Excuse me. You can have a situation where you have a small, rip up a small piece of paper, put it on a tabletop. It's lying there. Put your finger on it and see if you can pick it up. Well, you put your finger on the small bit of paper, nothing happens. You pick it up, it won't go up. Now then, wet your finger and put the paper down and touch the paper now with your wet finger, all right? And notice that you've agglomerated the paper to your finger. So this is the idea of surface debris and coating to prevent bonding. You can add a coating to cause bonding, right? So, nature of the surface of your finger, you change by adding moisture to it. You change to literally the chemical composition of your finger, changing the nature of the agglomeration. Asian of larger particles is possible. Binder is added to increase contact area, increase bonding force. Larger particles may undergo uh, plastic deformation, smooth their surfaces for increasing contact, contacting. Van der Waal forces, other forces are allowed to act over larger areas if brittle breakage occurs. Uh, you got something that's brittle, you break it down, you expose more surface area, so that gives rise to more Van der Waal forces or other forces. Very small particles, less than one uh, micron adheres easily. There's a gluing effect, you could call it gluing. Occurs when attractive forces are much greater than the weight. Right. Such adhesive forces may be 10,000, 10 to the fourth higher than the weight itself. Plastic deformation occurs and to increase surface area. So you have binding and attractive forces are acting in a network particles in agglomerate. Number of contact points or near point contact points become important. Agglomerate uh, agglomeration tendency is high for bulk, if bulk mass consists of material with a wide particle size distribution. Lots and lots of contact points, small particles form the voids, different levels.
Okay. When particles are dried, solvents often remain in the interior of the particle. This gives rise to something called wet on the inside, dry on the outside. Over time, these residual solvents will diffuse to the surface and form bonds, right? Moisture from the air can be absorbed. Calcium chloride, standard, right? It'll absorb, it'll be single particles or single particles and then uh, collects up moisture, it'll form big lumps. You can also have salt lumps from uh, calcium chloride. Bonding can come from hydration or any surface reaction. Different levels of binding, you're gonna have absorbed moisture binding, liquid bridges in terms of the presence of surface. Okay, water con uh, concentrates with the solids, act like glue to form solid bridging. Actual bonding strength is specific to the material, humidity, and the process. Hydrated materials are likely to be free-flowing. Most dehydrated materials will absorb moisture from the surroundings and bond. Water vapor is very, is the most common cause of agglomeration, right? Most common cause of agglomeration. Chemisorption of water hydration. Solid bridges, now that's interesting. Now solid bridges is different than liquid bridges. Liquid bridges are formed from a liquid, solid bridges are from solid, solid contacting. Well, anyway, here I have this listed. Uh, particles become wet, dissolve, form a bridge upon drying. Cindering is also an example. I was talking about two particles coming in contact with each other. Now they have a contact point. So the question becomes, um, what temperature is that contact point? Remember when we were hit, cooking hot dogs in the microwave, we had contact point. We had energy from one hot dog meeting the energy from another hot dog at that contact point. So that contact point literally had twice the energy than the ordinary hot dog surface. Contact points sort of double lots of things, double lots of things. So there's also high friction at contact points. Oh, but I don't feel the friction. Uh, you have substantial friction at contact points that could possibly raise the local temperature. So uh, giving rise with the temperature rise with some melting of the material. And since the material is melted, they have a tendency to fuse together, right? Adhesion is high for smaller particles, much more area per volume. Electrostatics charges, smaller particles adhere to larger particles. Absorbed layers become part of the solid. The material fuels, fuses in with the solid. We're talking about cinder bridges uh, will occur by diffusion at two thirds the melting temperature of the solid. That's kind of interesting. The solid doesn't actually melt, but due to the proximity, they're right there. And due to the fact that you got frictional heating at that point, the temperature could be very high. Okay, locally, could be very high. Temperature of a spark is a doorknob and walking across the carpet, the temperature of that spark that you get from static charge is 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a very high temperature considering. Heat may be coming from external sources, cindering increases with large surface areas and higher pressure. Higher pressure means higher friction, Higher friction means higher temperature and more ability to fuse together. Agglomeration by frictional heating is quite common. Okay, it causes unwanted agglomeration and caking in materials, low melting points also cake easier. So if you may, I don't know if you've been paying attention to your melting points, but you should. Care should be taken with certain materials, i.e. low melting point materials, materials with low heat capacity, low thermal conductivity. These materials tend to melt easily. Lower thermal conductivity takes a while for the heat to diffuse. The heat stays local longer. 
Local high energy input from frictional friction agglomerates material easy. Fine powders relatively have relatively more contact points, more sensitivity to humidity. Agglomerates formed by deprivation of materials, depri materials at the contact points, charged or colloidal particles often do this. Crystallization can alter, uh, can, can alternate between dissolution and crystallization. Caused by temperature changes, high temperature dissolves, low temperature forms a bridge. Again, incomplete drying. We said earlier, dry on the outside, wet on the inside. Moisture is left on the inside, diffuses outward, forms a bond. This is common, very common. Drying can leave behind bridges. Uh, strength of the binding by crystalline bridges may be dependent upon the speed of evaporation. Okay, bridges formed by colloidal particles as liquid evaporates are compacted by surface tension. Higher surface tension gives higher strength. That's interesting. Surface tension causes or enhances agglomeration. Finer particles attract material from the atmosphere. Absorption layers may not be free flowing. Testing, testing, testing some more. Static charging or static charge, important material moving relative to another part, another material can cause a static charge buildup. Okay, and sparking may reach high temperatures. Okay. We're looking at uh, effects of powder mixing. You can have sparks upon discharge. You can also have material clinging to the wall. These are examples of static electricity. Effects are not dissolved, a desired dissolve, uh, discharge can be predicted. Don't know the size of the discharge can and do cause dust explosions. Basically for particles to cling the weight, uh, particle weight has to be less than electrostatic force. I take a look at weight to the, the charge amount, the charge being proportional to the area, weight being proportional to the cube. The ratio of weight to charge is 1 over D. When D gets very small, the electrostatic forces dominate, right? The weight disappears, right? Literally, the weight disappears. Materials from insulators, uh, good conductors. Here, I'm amused by this. This is really great here. Okay, I have one size distribution right here. This is what was presented to the screen. Although I don't know that there's clinging particles here. I don't know these clinging particles exist at all. So I do size measurements on this and I get huge amounts of large particles intermediate particles and whatnot. So next day, um, these particles are adhering due to static cling. There's a humidity front coming through. Humidity increases significantly. And this static cling that was here is shorted out. So all these particles drop off the larger sizes. So now, without this adhering material, I have this size distribution. However, on close examination, I suddenly have an increase in fines. For doing absolutely nothing, I have an increase in fines. Well, I, nothing didn't really happen. I mean, I did have a change in humidity. So I have this size distribution, and suddenly I now have this size distribution over here. This is a distribution of adhering spheres. Isn't that a kicker? You gotta watch out for size distributions. Did you ever believe them to begin with? Anyway, I was always amused by size distributions, never did trust them. Of course, there's so what, four distri different distributions. You gotta figure out the number of versus size, the number versus size, then the size versus uh, size, I guess. And the area versus size, and then the area or volume versus size, or the mass versus size. There are all kinds of size distributions. You need to pay attention to all of them. And the number distribution is pretty, how many 
per size you have. That's concentration. Concentration is neglected as an area for powders. Case in point, you can tell me the size of a Cheerio, right? Cheerio has a certain size, but you cannot tell me how many Cheerios there are in a box of Cheerios. You can't probably tell me what the concentration is of Cheerios per volume is in that box either. So numbers often, size is measured, but often number or concentrations are in a neglected category. Air is an insulator, helps charge build up, water is a conductor, gets rid of it. <coughs> you want to prevent dust explosions, humidify the, uh, the storage area. Right, one is interested in breakdown strength, how much charge difference per length before the spark discharged. Interesting. Uh, as a binding force, electrostatics are relatively small except for small particles. Can vary at 10 to the fourth, 10 to the seventh, then square meter. Van der Waal forces due to transient polarization of molecules, typically 10 to the fourth, 10 to the seventh. Very fine particles are difficult to separate and separate from surfaces. Two major ways, uh, electrostatics and Van der Waals. All right. uh, Van der Waals are greater for electrostatics, except for small particles. Humidity plays a crucial role in determining relative importance of forces. Okay. Oh. Bond type dominate, and, excuse me, bridge type bonds dominate and help uh, significantly by humidity. Right. Uh, absorb moisture will increase Van der Waal forces and diminish electrostatic forces. Okay, this is sort of a trade off. Steps to reduce sensitivity to humidity and agglomeration, treat surface to make it less moisture loving coat. Hygroscopic coat powders with a small amount of hydrophobic material. So you got moisture loving, moisture hating. And what you're doing is you're poisoning the surface. When I say treat the surface, that's the same thing as poisoning or changing the surface, coating the powder changes also. Coat powder with a small amount of hydrophobic. Disperse a small amount of hydrophobic shielding powder or anti-caking agent, right? Obviously, if you want to stop caking, right, you don't want the moisture. So you eliminate moisture, uh, reduces caking, let's see. Disperse a small amount of hydrophobic shooting powder or anti-caking agent. It prevents contact between the surfaces. It shields the liquids and powders. It should not cause, shielding liquids and powders or powders do not cause condensation or cindering. Mm. Interlocking bonds. <clears throat> Uh, there's a natural tendency for, for materials to tangle up, agglomerate. Fibers and similar material interlock, weave, or fold about together. And you got flocculation and coagulation causes interlocking bonds and initial agglomerates. You have compressive and shield forces, which cause the same. Impaction and snowballing can cause seeds to form and start agglomeration. Now we got a whole bunch of strength of agglomerates depends upon the mechanism and material characteristics, the machine, the time effects can vary greatly. Different informa additional information, questions and data. Hmm. More questions. Important characteristic of agglomerate strength. Strength agglomerates may experience crushing, dropping, abrasion, impaction, all sorts of size reducing capabilities. Various tests exist from these areas to measure the resistance for breakage. They know empirical and you don't know the stress component to cause the failure. That's interesting. Results from um, different tests can't be compared. So what are we talking about here? Additional information, questions, and data. 
we're really shooting at the agglomerate strength here, All right? Results from different tests cannot be compared. The most single important property is tensile strength. Models exist for matrix and liquid fill agglomerates and contact agglomerates. Well, the lowest strength component determines the strength, the weakest link in the chain, so to speak. So for liquids to fill agglomerates, maximum tensile, uh, tensile strength is proportional to the porosity function, right? For liquid filled agglomerates, i.e. fill agglomerate becomes tougher, right? Maximum tensile strength is proportional to porosity function and also surface tension. Tensile strength is inversely proportional to grain or particle size. Tensile strength is proportional to number and size of contact points. Tensile strength is proportional to solids fraction. Uniform distribution strength of contact points and binder seldom occur. Climbers are often have weak points or weak spots. And testing agglomerates should be crack free, uniform stressed. Okay. Adhesion uh, bridges of liquid is proportional to surface tension, particle diameter, thickness, and diameter of the bridge. Adhesion due to uh, Van der Waal forces is proportional to particle diameter, inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Asian due to electrostatic forces fall into two possible categories. Excess charge, which is fairly simple, and then you have the famous electrical double layer. Hmm. Excess charge equation is available. The electrical double layer <coughs> says more important. All right, you're looking at four to seven, exponent 10 to the fourth, 10 to the seventh. Newtons per square meter stays constant over macroscopic macro distances. Little is known about the distribution of charges of different materials. So, data, 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 lots and lots of data, 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 data. Effect of fines on strength. Strength goes up, fines goes up. That's interesting. Tensile strength, porosity, liquid saturation, compaction, pressure, drying time. Particle size, surface tension, surface roughness, characterization of roughness is hard. Then adhesion, adhesive forces, geometry, surface roughness, electrical conductivity, and relative size. Voila. So then we have this theoretical tensile strength of conglomerates. Down in here, you have size here. In here, you have the intermolecular electrostatic forces. Up here you have uh, solid bridges and adhesion. And in between we have capillary, surface tension and capillary forces. What do you know what and how you are agglomerating, size and shape of your feet, or you be you seeding your process, surface tension, surface texture, roughness but not melting point, glass transition, tackiness point, softening point, et cetera, for your material. Call friction of friction, thermal conductivity, heat capacity, right? How much heat can it hold? Um, how quickly does the uh, heat move away? And what sort of coefficient of friction do you have? Friction causing heat. Temperature of your agglomerate, heat of hydration, surface charges of your agglomerate. How are you going to stop agglomeration? How are you going to stop agglomeration? Some of the things you might want to do. You want agglomeration, and sometimes you want to stop it. Anyway, so let me see what else do we have. Agglomeration equipment. <laughs> anyway, any questions so far? I, sorry, you don't answer questions. Anyway, I'm going to continue on, see how far I can get. Okay, well, let's go up here. Let's pause recording for a while. Okay, uh, let's start up again. Agglomeration equipment, run down through these. 
there's a whole bunch of different methods of which you do agglom agglomeration. Tumbling, you have discs and drums, mixers can be run as agglomerators, uh, mixer granulators, fluidized beds, granulators, spray drying, agglomeration, prilling, uh, of course, pelleting, uh, pressure compaction, extrusion, roll presses, tabulating presses, pellet mill, cindering, uh, then you get into some of these liquid systems, which I am not that familiar with, and pellet flocula flocculation. You have particle size, the densities involved, uh, statement of whether it's low density or high density, scale of operation, uh, what sort of uh, material they're making, right? Uh, typical applications in uh, in the business. My uh, first, my first father-in-law, May, it was trying to use agglomeration uh, to make pellets out of coal fines. Basically, he had a lot of fines from uh, coal operations, and they were trying to agglomerate it up and make. Uh, larger chunks of coal. I think he was working for consolidated coal. I don't know. Don't remember that closely. Anyway, we have the method again, the equipment used, the application, right? Various applications, all uh, contributing to, of course, society here, right? Uh, pressure, tumbling, uh, thermal, spraying, liquid systems. And we have the different types of machines here. Again, one of the best ways of understanding stuff is you read the, advertise, the advertisements about them. So achievable properties that are talked about, particle size, bulk density, wettability, particle shape, aesthetics, uh, color, Odor, interesting odor. The liquid binder, what sort of binder do you have in capacity? You have your briquetter that makes briquettes, and then you have granular with compaction, and you have a tubulizer. Uh, then you have the shugi flexomix, which flexible walls, kind of a intriguing, intriguing device. Then you have uh, extruders, extruder mix, and then we have gear pelletizers. Gear pelletizers would be here. Extrudo mix might be here. Well, this is compaction and granulation would be over here. Notice that we have a roller and a roller. This could turn around instead of agglomerating. Uh, you could actually crush the stuff. So depending upon the concentration of the binder and uh, the solids, you could either agglomerate or you can crush. Right? And this indicates that it is a uh, force fed. Here you have what is called the shugi mix and you have the flexible walls of the famous shugi mix. And apparently you throw in different particles and they will agglomerate to each other. This is old B-plex ad. Then we have this one here. You got capacity, pellet size, quantity of liquid or lubricant. You have two things in here. You have binder, which is substantial number, amount of different types of materials that are binders. And then you have material lubricants. So you have that to look forward to. Compatibility, sticky gummy feeds. Flexible, strong product, capital cost. Anyway, you have tabulating presses, you have roller type presses, you have pellet mill extruder, you have a pug mill extruder, you have discs and then drums, and you see prilly mill. So you have A, excellent or no limitations. So if I look at here, drum, 
doesn't have very good rating here. If I look to pan, well, uh, so the thrilling is kind of interesting. It's got a lot of A's, huh? Yeah, pug mill A's. Got some A's there. Unacceptable X. Well, they don't have any X's. Uh, modest limitations B, special units available. Look how typo they lost their L. Limited. The D's is what you want to avoid. What do we have? Oh, any, well, basically flexibility of product shape. There you go. All right. You know, how's a drum or a disc going to give you product shape? They shouldn't even rate that as part of the consideration for a tumbling mill. Or strong product, mechanically strong product. It's also a D rating here on uh, pans and drums. Uh, you got to take that with a bit of salt too, because even though it's not a mechanically strong product, right, it can be cured, and after curing, it becomes a strong product. So I'm not quite sure this D rating is. I'm not sure exactly where I got this slide from, but I would be uh, the strength of a product. You form the agglomerate, and it's typically green, and then you gotta operate on it, all right? Further process it, you dry it, or you, uh, you primarily dry it, or maybe you'll heat it to the point where uh, Anyway, these ratings are kind of on the flaky side for these. I mean, you have different equipment for different purposes, right? Let's try this E under Prilly Mill, come across. Uh, low dust product to see. So it's got atmospheric control E for flexible shape. Well, you, you know, you get pellets out of a Prilly Mill. Anyway, this is, uh, we'll toss this thing out maybe in the next review of this present, uh, next review of this. It's, it tends to be misleading. Nobody gets a drum for particle shape, right? And then the drum is not going to produce anything but green agglomerates which need further processing. Anyway, let's look at a few circuits here. First off, you have powder up here, it goes to a blender. Ah, uh, blenders, Mueller mill maybe or whatever. A rework bin comes in with ingredients. Hopefully this is free flowing and <clears throat> bin problems are not prevalent. Premix blend where you add binder fluid going to a grinder or granulator, sorry. Mixer mixing the binder and the premix. You make pellets out of here that's going to a classifier Classifier will send the intermediates up to the granulation bin or granular bin, and then you go to a tabulating press. And the tabulating press, you have products, product comes out, tablets. Okay. The top screen and the fines are, goes to the recycle bin. And since they have agglomeration in there, this bin will be a problem bin because uh, you already added the binding fluid. So I'd be worried about this recycle bin. In fact, I would take this feed and go directly into a kicker mill, make sure I separate all the powder, all the solids out from each other so they don't agglomerate. The fact that I got a binder going through there, no matter where that stuff goes through, I will potentially have clinkers being formed along the way. Now, I'm not quite thrilled with this circuit right here. Not completely thrilled. Anyway, you have um, bin. You got bin flow problems already because agglomeration can take place in a bin. That's the problem with bins. They can agglomerate. They can bridge over. They can agglomerate. They can uh, rat hole on you. There's just three or four of the problems with bins. Here's a turbulator. Now, turbulator is kind of cool. 
I may have been the only person that ever wrote a paper on a turbulator. Anyway, it goes through a turbulator, you make fine seeds, and then you come up here and you go to pellet curing. Okay. Stacker conveyor. Anyway, curing is very important in all this, you know. Here we have one to make the turbulator, you make fine seeds, okay? And then from the fine seeds, then you feed a uh, pan pelletizer. Okay. So what else do we have? We have a conditioning bin. That'd be trouble right there. I would have some sort of way of making sure there's continuous motion in here. Again, I would also be worrying about whether I wind up uh, creating agglomerates. Anytime you have agglomeration circuit, you got to worry about whether you're forming the agglomerate before the agglomeration machine. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. And whether those agglomerates that you formed previously are what you want or uh, may hinder your processing. So a turbulator is supposed to make seeds and those seeds grow, but the seeds themselves are an agglomerator. Anyway, up here is compost. There we go. What do we got here? We got storage bins going to a pan, going to a fluidized bed. This is a rotary fluidized bed dryer going to screening and off goes the product. Anyway, here we have uh, slurry, vacuum. We have a belt filter going into a, feeding a pan pelletizer. Here we may have uh, plaster Paris Portland cement going into a feeder. Intro, re-roll ring, hmm, conveyor to a stacker. Anyway, different circuits. So we have uh, major ways of agglomeration we're going to talk about is tumbling agglomeration and also pressure agglomeration. Other factors or other methods uh, are, uh, you're interested in all kinds of stuff heat of agglomeration, spraying techniques, solidification, capillary action, coating, flocculation, a whole bunch of stuff. This is kind of an interesting diagram. Got a huge nomenclature, which is up here. And you can see uh, fluidized beds, pans, drums are down here. And you go to higher levels of mixers. And you go to radial extrusions, and you're looking at pressure here. Tabulating machines, you're getting up to very high pressures, rolling presses to high pressures, extrusion. Here it's more of a compaction, you're making tablets, and here you're doing wet processing, which has a huge range of pressures involved. And then you have low agitation type of lot. So this would be, I guess, very strange combination, low agitation versus high agitation versus wet processing versus compaction. So that's an interesting way of looking at agglomeration. Okay. And then I don't know what this nomenclature was for other than somewhere else. I think I lifted this out of uh, Barry Sambo and they lifted it out of this uh, granulation and coating technologies. 1966. So anyway, tumble agglomeration relies on growth of spheres. So you're going from powder to binder. This is uh, going from powder and binder spheres, often called balling. You have wet green agglomerates or seeds formed. The strength of the green agglomerates is due to interfacial forces as discussed. Okay. Equipment commonly used for tumbling includes discs, pans, drums, cones. Same size enlargement mechanism occurs in different equipment. However, differences do occur between machines. Obviously, you should select a machine that gives you the desired results. The question is, what do you want? That's the tough one right there. What is it you want? The way you figure that out is, uh, or one way of figuring that out, you go figure out what other people are doing. Uh, or other 
the food people, okay? You're inside um, a food company and you have to do something with uh, agglomeration. So you go and see what the fertilizer people are doing, or you go see what the uh, pharmaceutical people are doing, or you go to other industries that are in line competing with you, or you find out uh, what your competitors are doing and you do that, then you're, uh, or you find out what your competitors are doing and you don't do that, but you study what, how they're doing it, okay. So what do you want uh, depends upon uh, how, how uh, what what your knowledge level is, right? Well, what you want can be answered very quickly if you have a lot of experience, but if it's a new process, you may not have a lot of experience. So you go and see what other people are doing. Very helpful. Again, food finds out what pharmaceutical is doing. Pharmaceuticals people may find new handling methods. Uh, powder show, you go to the powder show, you ask around. Right. Typical operations, uh, well, what equipment gives you the desired results? I mean, you're not the first person to invent the wheel, right? The wheel has been invented many times before. And what you are making uh, has similar items already on the market. Either that or you have a uniquely different product. So oftentimes, and that's a good way of starting design. You figure out what other people use, are using, and that will be their methodology, and that would be a good start on your design. Certainly, uh, people are not perfect, okay? We take a look at here. In this situation, I have a binding material going into the recycle, and I can tell you right there that that ain't a good idea. Okay, and so I would want to monitor the uh, or somehow judge the assessment of the binder. That's not good. You know, just between me and you, that's right there is a processing problem. Let's see, where were we? Equipment rotates around an axis, powder material is added, binder sprayed on the powder, agglomeration occurs, the material build up on agglomerates during tumbling, rolling, sliding on agglomerate powders. Agglomerated material overflows the pan, rim product. Now then, uh, disadvantages, uh, this pan rotates, results in size separation, largest agglomerates always travel to the top and near the rim, right, in pan agglomeration. Uh, equipment classifies agglomerates, that's a good idea. Control, uh, control allows size, an agglomeration to be produced, a fixed size agglomeration to be produced in discs. The advantage is there's no recycle, no recycle of undersized and no recycle of oversized. Drums are not as giving, they're large, right? Require large recycle. There is no recycle with pants. Require screening, crushing, recycle. Then you get into design modifications. Continue or blast, uh, continuous or batch mixing are added. Conveyor, vibrating conveyors, dryers are added. Here's a picture of a pan, or, uh, very large, gives you the segregation or size separation that occurs in a pan over here. You have, uh, what diameter is this? This is five meters. If you take the meter to be about three feet. So you have 15 feet, maybe 16 feet. The kilowatt hours, you change that into horsepower. And then you talk about the material that you're agglomerating up. And you can, remarks, you can have. So again, you can, this is the idea of seeing what other people did, right? Motor, at this size, horsepower, capacity. What they're not, I guess they're assuming you're feeding powder, but they don't necessarily tell you the binder that they're using. See, so you have recycle fines. Well, probably not going to happen with a disc. You have undersized product is probably coming out. Well, depending, it probably comes up on one side. Reciprocating, you worry about your sprays, you worry about your scrapers, and rotation, which direction is rotation. 
I'm just curious, coleolus forces, I'm just curious what sort of effects coleolus forces are having on this. Probably on coleolus forces is, uh, causes vortex formation and draining of a tank and liquids, but I'm just curious if there isn't any effects that are apparent in uh, pan agglomerate, that'd be cool. Here we have a drum, we have granulated fertilizer, iron ore balling, diameter, length of the drum, installed power, RPM, boy, they're low RPM. Capacity, now we're talking 90 tons per hour, woohoo, 40 tons per hour. What's important in this drum, uh, okay, first off, it's large recycle, so it's very important. I don't know what one and two is up here. One is at 20% critical speed and the other one's at 50% critical speed. So performance data on units. So you have some sort of effect of uh, size distribution with uh, critical speed is when everything's centered to a fuge to the wall here. <clears throat> you have a much sharper distribution when you're running at a fixed speed, right? Or excuse me, at a higher speed, you have a sharper distribution. <laughs> Low speed gives you broader distribution. Anyway, again, uh, these things exist in industry. You go out and find some people that are using them. You go ask if you can visit and talk to them about the performance of this thing. Same thing with this pan agglomerator. Pan agglomerators, a huge uh, 25 feet, right? Some of, them, some of the sizes I've seen 25 feet, not 15, 16 feet, some of 25. You gotta adjust the uh, tilt here. You can adjust your spray bars and uh, Outer feeds. Okay. Other agglomerators, why well, you can have batch and continuous dryers produce granular materials. The advantage of the pan is it makes one size, one uniform size. Material can form agglomerates, uh, pass through screens, eccentric motion and troughs, agglomerate fine particles. No binders are needed for fine particles. Ah, you know. Binders should always be considered. Uh, crushing may be necessary if clustering occurs. Fluidized bed agglomeration, well, particle-particle impact build, is a build-up mechanism, forms a granular product. Powders and binders are fed to the bed. Uh, largest agglomerators sink to the bottom, sink due to their weight, discharge out the bottom, agglomerates are Dry and fluidized bed, fluidized beds are particularly suited for relatively small. Glomerates, feeds, maybe powder or suspension or sludges or filter cakes. Flow is usually turbulent. Uh, the idea of a fluidized bed is that they make instantization products. Apparently, one chap said it's only possible in fluidized beds. Anyway, I don't know if that's true or not. But fluidized beds are very important. Agglomeration and turbulent liquid suspensions, right? Liquid binder is immersible, is immiscible in liquids. Solids adhere to the secondary liquid to agglomerate. Second method is agglomerate form naturally if particles, form naturally if particles attract each other, basically is what it would said there. Solids adhere to the secondary liquid to agglomerate. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I wonder, that'd be kind of cool. Anyway, we have our friend, the extruder up here of some sorts. You have, I've never seen this before. Roto feed, and this is the baby, that, the baby here. Uh, this is a co-kneader. This thing rotates and reciprocates at the same time. So you uh, have a situation where the shaft goes up and down slightly as the same time is rotating. So then you have stationary breaker bars or stationary teeth. And it's kind of interesting. Basically, you have solids coming into the top and you squeeze it through uh, screens, 
That's kind of interesting. You collect the stuff down here below. Here you have an extruder. By the way, an extruder does not mix. Okay, it's very important to recognize that extruder doesn't mix. Typically, you have um, compression zone, perhaps a metering zone. Anyway, A, what's it say? Screw type for molten plastics. Okay, you have granular feed, and now pops some sort of sheet that you cut or whatever. Then we have the uh, roll mills, right? And B, we have ring extruders, screw conveyors and spaces between the inner rolls. This is a roll mill, I call it. Several things happen that basically this uh, machine moves this way, right? It moves this way. Let's see if that's right. Basically, in front of the roller, there's a plow that moves material to in front of this roller, and this roller then takes this material and pushes it through through screens, through the die, okay? And you have a cutter blade on the outside. Right. So I suspect that uh, die is turned 90 degrees purpose. Anyhow, uh, again, you have the rollers going this direction and this direction over a bed, right? Over a bed of solids, right? This apparently is the overall rotation going this direction. And the, the uh, material is forced through the dies, and you cut them off over here. You have the extrudate, the material that's been extruded over here. It comes all the way down over here to be cut off. Then you have this one right in here to be cut off, and these two are collected on the same side. But the, the idea is you got some sort of device that pushes the material to the die, you got some sort of device that perhaps raises it so the roller can contact it and then you push it through the die, the dies. And then the, the material that's been extruded is cut off with knives. So this is more or less uh, size. It's not necessarily agglomeration, more than just uh, sizing. We have uh, four feet of a gill gear pelletizer. Again, these uh, were what we were talking about earlier. You could perhaps have dies that are mounted on rollers and the material is caught in the nip and extruded through the inside. And then you have cutter blades around the perimeter. And here we have, uh, what is this, a Mueller Mills? Mueller Mills, the die is at the bottom down here, right? Uh, then you have plows, again, moving the material in front of the roller. The Mueller mills are coming. There's no such guy as Mueller, right? This guy is this, the operation It's called muling. Basically, you have plows to force the material under the rolling wheels, and the wheels squeeze the material through dies. Here you got material being squeezed through dies. Here you got material being screwed, screwed through dies. Here you have stuff being screwed through, uh, shoved through dies. Now this direction, stuff is rotating like this. And this rotates like this. Okay. So you make the pellets that way. Most materials fuse with hot pressing. That's interesting. Let's go back to see where we were before we entered. Okay, this is pressure agglomeration. Uh, this forces solids to adhere due to pressure, sometimes molding. Sometimes very large solids, excuse me, very large forces are acting in combined volume. Material, uh, material is plastic fine powder, no binder is necessary, and what material will deform and bind. You're looking for interlocking bonds in some cases. You're looking for partial melting in others. 
you're looking for material with low melting points that may fuse together. So again, this is the some of the pressure agglomeration type devices we have. Okay. Pressure is accomplished by pistons, rollers, extrusion, and pelleting processes. Piston presses or uh, uh, presses operate either mechanical or hydraulic. I think the hydraulic is supposed to have the highest pressures. Okay, material is packed in or densified, shaped by an oscillating piston and reciprocal form. Contact compacted materials have an accurate shape and weight. Limitation operating machines, you have a high acceleration limit. Right, high accelerations limit the number of cycles per time, right? How many reciprocating pushes or oscillating you can have? It's only so many you can have per time, All right? Feed dies at high speeds, also difficult. Feeding dies at high speeds, also difficult. Handling fines at high speed is difficult. So we have pressers, presses for powder metallurgy, lots of different designs for lots of different methods or different materials. Presses vary greatly, two designs, eccenter presses and tabulating machines, eccentric, eccenter presses, this must be from England. Uh, eccentric presses, tabulating machines produce uniform, produce highly uniform product size and shape. Feed is mostly powder. So roll presses, right, based upon two rollers of equal size. Again, we were suggesting perhaps three rollers, an odd number to balance out the forces. Rollers, counter rotate, same speed. Oh, this is for roll presses, sorry. That's for this type of thing right here, roll presses. Roll presses. Right, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, roll presses are employed large, for large capacities, rollers of equal size, rollers counter rotate at the same speeds, may be profiled or toothed. Material is fed from the top into the nip, the nip catches it, hopefully. Material is densified, formed while pressing through the nip is released. Speed and collection are such that not to break the form. The credit ro rollers have pockets or dies which define the product's shape. Compacting rollers vary significantly. You can have smooth, corrugated, waffled, structured strips, sheets, and flakes. Mm. Uh, you have compacting rollers that create sheets or create flakes, whereas the rollers themselves could be smooth, corrugated, waffled, structured. This will then transfer into the product. The product will be smooth, corrugated, waffle, structured strips. So there's, may not be an agglomeration taking place, maybe just a shaping, resizing, and cutting. All right. If you melt something and form it, it's an agglomeration, probably not. It would not be considered agglomeration. Some of these, devices are obviously just taking material and uh, here you have a size being formed. Here you're just, ref you may be just marking. Uh, this one has compression where you're pushing material together. This has compression pushing material together. Let's see, where were we? Talking about roll crushers. May not be agglomeration taking place, just shaping, sizing, cutting. Isostatic or hydraulic presses, uh, compacts material into shapes using fluid pressure and flexible mold, helps in attaining uniform density of mold material. Pressure causes the mold to expand and contract, and the mold may be a part of the press or removed. The mold may be a part of the press or is removed with the material. Then we have extrusion pressures, pelleting machines, materials forced through bores and dyes, ex extensive mixing ice shear occurs, uh, pressure and temperature builds up along the length. This is extruders, right? Heater and coolers, extensive mixing. Well, maybe a single screw extruder does not mix very well. 
you need a twin screw extruder to mix well. Heaters and coolers add along the length, binders are added to the feed, binders help significantly to obtain significant plasticity and strength. Okay, extrusion pressures, screws, and vacuum extruders. We have statements with that. Excentered drive extrusion presses for material already for agglomeration dies and excenter presses perform densification and shaping. Screw extruders mix and melt plasticizers and material for agglomeration. Vacuum extruders are for higher demand product quality. Different roller types, LED machines. Well, you have Mueller mills. Mills use rollers to press the material through bores and dies. Motion causes material release. That's interesting. Got to figure out if that has an effect. Other uses uh, gear geometry to pull materials into the die and bores. Geometry improves the grip on the material. You got to grip it. There's less bump in the nip if it's gripped. Another type is a roller inside the die roller. The roller inside the die roller, right? The nip is on the inside. The material is extruded outward, cut off with a knife. Anyway, now there is the pull. The material is pulled into an outside nip, extruded through dies. Material is then cut off with a knife on the inside of the roller. Hmm. And other size enlargement <clears throat> processes. Agglomeration is a natural tendency for lots of materials. As a result, uh, agglomeration may occur in lots of different equipment. Even though you have a, a word out there that says whatever, you can have agglomeration occurring in there no matter what. Uh, un unintentionally, agglomeration may occur in lots of different equipment. Wall buildup, not desired, but that's agglomeration. Okay. Equipment may uh, then becomes an agglomerator. Cindering, important in the iron ore industry. Materials heated into the cinder bridges develop. Cinders are crushed to desired size. Fines are recycled. Spray drying can be agglomerating. The process uh, slurries are dried into particles or directly into agglomerates. Particles may also form agglomerates. Basically, you form the powder and then you throw it in the fluidized bed and you spray dry and you want to have a spray dryer and then followed by a fluidized bed. That would give you the most versatility. Drying, uh, spray dryer gives the drying operation and fluidized bed gives the agglomeration. Process controlled by heat and droplet formation. Initial agglomerates are determined from prop droplet size. Yeah, the uh, droplet size uh, determines the initial starting or seed size for the agglomerates, and depending upon how the agglomerates grow, they can grow by simple clumping together. Uh, particles join to form agglomerates. Uh, usually, a fluidized bed follows a spray dryer. Or spray drying for drying, fluidized bed for agglomeration. And as I said earlier, I perhaps said it too many times already, uh, fluidized bed, uh, one guy said, you can't do it any, any way else, any, any, by any other means. The instantization that you need. Prilling is kind of interesting. You have a uh, spray in a drying chamber, and you have certain particle size, or excuse me, certain drop size, and you shoot it up into the drying chamber and you form a product or a pill, prill. We'll call it a pill, prill, a prillable material. You collect it here and then the uh, perhaps, perhaps there is some uh, fines that are carried off that's collected in the uh, cyclone and perhaps to the exhaust or another Another uh, cl uh, particle collector. Inlet air, you may want to have a filter. You may want to have a heater. So all drying operations, you consist of three things. The feed that you want to dry, obviously. 
the uh, heater, so you have, and then you have the airflow rate. So you have airflow rate, the heating rate, and the drying rate, right? Those are the three biggies in a dryer, right? right. And a list of probable materials. I suspect lots and lots of things are probable. Some characteristics, well, tube height, 130 feet. Wow, cross-sectional area, 21 feet. Or a rectangular cross-section, 21, what's that, 11 by 11. Flow rate of cooling air, temperature rise, the melt, urea and ammonium nitrate. Perlating of size is in millimeters, one to three millimeters. Inlet temperature, 275, 365 Fahrenheit outlet temperature. See, the air gets cooled. The air picks up the moisture and, or whatever it is. This is pounds, water, pounds. We gotta watch out for what the units are. Feed rate and urea, I'm not quite sure what this concentration levels are given here. Things are not always exactly clear. Anyway, let's move on. Other, let's go up here. So we have Prilly machines, right? Okay, drops are formed from a mount law to form usually against countercurrent airflow. All sorts of materials can be prilled, drop solidify to a spherical particle, and then individual pro particles are uh, agglomerated. That's interesting. Granular powders uh, need uniform composition feeding material. Granulation of powders, right? Particle size varies from 100 microns to millimeter. Coneaters and extruders are used for very, for, uh, very uniform granulars. So we have our prilling information. Extruded the spaghetti-like strings that are cooled and cut. Other granulators are screwed, extrude, screw, extruders, screw, extruders. Injection molding uh, machines, form presses, use, used for processing pla plastics. Powder plastics and additives must be mixed first. Granulation takes place in a plastic state where the material sticks easily together. Granulates are then cut to size. Additives uh, may be lubricants, excuse me, may be colorants, pigments, dyes, lubricants, stabilizers, plasticizers. And input is controlled only by surface smelting. Energy input is controlled to have only surface smelting. Granulation by accretion, accretion. Glomerate, glomerates are sprayed into a thin film of slurry which dries. Accretion, accretion, that's it. Accretion, sorry. Batch mixers. Hmm. Let's go back to that one right there. Glomerates and granular uh, granulate are sprayed into a thin film. The thin film dries, leaving behind the solids, which as they dry, it clumps up. Okay, that's what happens with this type of situation. Kind of an interesting way of doing uh, agglomeration. Batch mixers, uh, rolling, uh, rotating pin mills or discs. Hmm. Commonly used method for granulation of plastic powders, mixes, crushes, heats. Heats added by mechanical friction, possible to monitor power input and rotation. Temperature of the material may rise, surface melting may occur, uh, causing materials to stick or agglomerate together. Process to stop when RPM is lowered or when stopping dust is added or another processing event occurs, right? Now the idea with anything and it's rotating, uh, you have processing time and you have rotational speed. 
So you take the processing time times the rotational speed, and you come up with the number of revolutions. And to characterize anything that has rotating nature to it, you count how many revolutions it's experienced. Getting back to extruders, right? Any rotating piece of equipment, extruders or Mueller mills or what have you, take this thing for example, there's so many revolutions the material will experience before leaving. There's so many revolutions the material will experience when leaving. There's so many revolutions material will experience with leaving. So many revolutions the material will experience. In this case, it's back and forth oscillating. So many revolutions material experiences. So the revolutions is what really matters, right? You put 100 pounds in here, how long does it take for those 100 pounds to go through the die, right? So that will give you, how many revolutions does it take to push it through the die? Time doesn't mean anything. In this rotating stuff, time is worthless, actually. What you want to know is how many revolutions, well, time may or may not be worth it. Let's go back. Anyway, the number of revolutions is what counts, right? These pellet sizes that are formed, that's a function of the rate at which they're formed. That's a function of uh, how fast the RPM is. Okay, so this would be dependent upon rotational speed. However, to do a Mueller mill here, uh, put in 100 pounds, how long, will, how many revolutions did it take for the material to go through the dies? So several things, you got time, which you've all been using since the beginning of time, I guess. But then you got to step back away from it. Anything that has rotating equipment to it, you need to take the rotational speed times the time and that gives you revolutions. So then you start to talk about how many revolutions does the material experience before leaving the process. That's very important. Revolutions is what causes the action or causes the processing. Time doesn't, doesn't do anything for you, really. Case in case in point, I have a student, comes to class, comes to the front row, falls asleep, sleeps an hour, and leaves. Now that student slept for an hour, he had a residence time in my class of an hour, but he didn't learn a single thing, right? So just because you're inside a piece of equipment doesn't mean that you have had or experienced processing. An example of time and how worthless this is, this is demonstrated with your clothes dryer at home, right? Clothes dryer at home. You dry for 30 minutes. Well, the question is, how did you dry for 30 minutes? Well, there's tumbling going on in your dryer. Okay, so you take the rotational speed of your dryer times the time of drying, right, will give you the number of tumbles that your clothes experienced. Now then, you take your wet clothes, put it in the dryer for 30 minutes, but not tumble it the clothes will not be dry, right? It's not the tumbling, right? tumbling action is necessary. Time is also necessary, but you can have situations where the stuff just sits there and not tumble and it's not dry. So it's important to start specifying how many tumbles the material has experienced. Clothes sitting in a clothes dryer is not tumbled. They don't experience any tumble, tumbling. The tumbling creates the uh, contacting. So all this rotating equipment, you got to back off and start thinking about the number of revolutions that things have been experienced. Let's see here. Trilling. Oh, our pug mill coming up here. Cretion, right? That's kind of cool. I got to try that somewhere. So you have an assignment. I want you to take some wax paper at home. I want you to mix up a slurry of whatever, and then let it dry. A uh, slurry of some solder solids and see if uh, what sort of agglomerates you make, right? Or another one is, uh, I got a various experiments at the end here that I want you to go through and do. We'll catch up for some of those later. Okay. 
Bax mixers, again, mixing, uh, crushing, heating, flaw. You want to worry about how many tumbles the material has experienced. Worse yet, I can have a closed dryer. I have tumbling action going on. I have 30 minutes happening, but the sheets have all balled up into a big ball, and now they're not dry on the inside, but they're dry on the outside, but wet on the inside. Again, very poor drying, very poor tumbling action, very poor contacting, leading to a real mess. Actually, the sheets are actually an agglomerated sheets, I guess. Commonly used method of granulation, mixes, crushes, heats, heats added, surface melting occurs, causing particles to stick together. Process stops when RPMs lowered, okay, when stopping dust is added, Addition of powder coating increases surface roughness, slowish friction, changes melting behavior. Strong granulars are formed. Anyway, we have a high shear impeller, pharmaceutical industry. You have several things in here. You have uh, binding liquid being added. You have sprays. You have a swirling. I don't know if it's a swirling bed. You have a impeller going around and plows, perhaps. And then you have breaker bars or a chopper in there. So binder, binding liquid, no solids coming in from the top. Okay, horizontal uh, side view. Anyway, we have our famous pug mill. Pug mills. Okay. Mixing times, I don't know if you call, they have various names. And again, video, there's videos on YouTube, videos everywhere on this sort of stuff. You just gotta find it. They're very impressive. They do a very good job. They're very educational, They'll let you understand what your process is doing. So pug mills, it's just another, uh, this is an abbreviated extruder perhaps. And this thing mixes very well. And then after you got it mixed, then you shove it through a die, perhaps. Size enlargement equipment, well, we've just gone through a lot of those, right? I like gummy pastes, well, I'll use pellet mills, there you go. Pug mills, extruders, ideal for mixing. Glomerators, loosely packed pro product, low cost, operating costs are low, prilling. Encapsulation and microencapsulation process, kind of special type of agglomeration. It's relatively new. I wouldn't say it's a new process, I'd better say it's relatively new. Type of packing method, small amount of materials physically wrapped in a shell. It forms a coating on a sphere, sort of like how they make lock jaws, candies, right? You have pelletizers, or what is it, pan pelletizers. You, your assignment, you have assignment. Okay, I want you to go find out how jelly beans are made. Okay, so you have the jelly bean production, you uh, have an agglomeration process going on of sorts where one layer is added on top of another layer. Small amount of materials physically wrapped into a shell forms a coating in spherical shape. It's different layers of jelly beans basically, but it's not physically wrapped. It's the liquids there. One encapsulation is electrostatic encapsulation. Okay. Other capsules are produced by surface in situ process, surface reactions, emulsion. I got involved with encapsulating ink. Okay. 10 micron drops of ink encapsulated in a small amount of uh, surface, surface material. Ah, uh, when you wrote with it, it broke open the little capsules, leaving a stain. So what do we got? Surface reactions, emulsions. What do we got here? Capsule walls may be porous, soluble, insoluble, permeable, impermeable. Impermeable. Uh, capsules are used extensively to improve material exchange, used in drugs, chemical release, toner release, improved handling. Plays an important role in the immunization of enzyme cells and bacteria. Interesting, interesting. Anyway, so I gave you some questions here. Happy agglomeration to you. And here we go. Here's some experiments I want you to do or let's go through this. 
I want you to take some powdered sugar and put it in a bowl. And I want you to add a drop of water over the powdered sugar and roll around the drop. The drop rolls around, it should become larger and larger. Actually, I want you to go out and make a snowman, right? Or a snow woman, right? How do you make a snow woman or a snowman? You tar start with a small snowball, put it down on the wet snow. Hopefully the wet snow agglomerates and it's not dry snow. And um, there's like 96 different types of snow. Anyway, uh, see how long it takes you to agglomerate up a big snowball for the bottom of your snow person. And uh, you got to recognize roll distance determines the uh, distance of snowball, uh, the size of snowball. Okay. The longer you roll it, the bigger the snowball, right? Now I want you to take a small piece of paper. We already said this. Pick it up with your finger. Now wet your finger and repeat. One piece, uh, one, one shows no agglomeration. The next one shows agglomeration. Uh, concrete blocks are agglomerates. Sugar, powdered sugar on cookies. A hard candy prevents agglomeration of cookies. Grated cheese. Oh, jeez. I forgot. You go to the store and you buy grated cheese. Well, you got to read closely. Okay. It's grated cheese, but then you have stopping dust in there in your grated cheese. Because grated cheese, the first thing it wants to do is agglomerate back up. You put rice and salt. Salt has a tendency to absorb moisture from the air. And you put rice and salt to absorb the moisture. Hard candy, we've already said several times. So uh, basically, hard candy with sugar coating will stop agglomeration. Uh, dirty trick with copper sulfide, dry it out, it becomes a powder. Put it in your hand and add water, then you got huge heat release water hydration, so you wind up from a powder, a chemical reaction going to a crystal. That's not pleasant. Uh, a trick my brother did to me when I was young. Uh, he's four years older. Anyway, agglomeration poses major problems in nanotechnology, I assure you. Getting down to solid binary sizes, physics changes, surfaces become there's no uh, nano, uh, sm very small, there's very little mass. Don't forget to read magazine ads for equipment. They're, tell they're very telling in the type of material. So those are a few things that I want you to do. I also, want, uh, it's up there, did I not say, I want you to make a snowman or snowwoman. Watch out for all the agglomeration mechanisms out there. Forgot to mention, uh, Particles, you're always dealing with particles. You should also deal with a particle separation. You take a box of cereal at home. Where are all the fines in a box of cereal? It's at the bottom of the cereal. Didn't start out that way, but over time, the fines fell off the cereal and fell to the bottom. Most of the sugar, some of the sugar fell off the cereal and fell to the bottom as well. So there's a lot of agglomeration processes that are around you all the time. And there's also a lot of processes that are de-agglomerating around you all the time. I don't know about if the dandruff is agglomerate. I don't know if that's true or not. But dandruff on your shoulder has already agglomerated on your shoulder. So it's an agglomerate of sorts, it's socially. Uh, anyway, my... Uh, Famous sources, uh, size enlargement, crushing and grinding goes hand in hand with size enlargement. I, like I was saying, you put an agglomerate and a, a binder in the, into your powder and then you try to recycle that powder or it becomes the powder becomes the fines and, and recycle and it's carrying with it a binder. That's sort of like a, asking for trouble. And I wish you a happy agglomeration to you all and uh, have a good evening. I'm going to stop now. Hope you learned something and
I'll stop the recording and have a good night.